Well, the uh, first weekend in May is a big classical release day, one of the two biggest weekends of the year. And I am simultaneously ecstatic and anxious because <laughs> there's so many great recordings that I want to hear. And first of all, I can't possibly buy them, so I'm going to have to listen to them all on uh, streaming. And um, we have another issue now because there are so many of these that I don't have the time to listen to them all, and I really do want to hear them all. Wow. Yeah, I really wish this was a... If this was an everyday podcast, if we could do this like five days a week, I'd, I actually, I'd have to listen in the morning and then just kind of prepare my notes and right. go on the air at night. I, that wouldn't be a bad thing for a while, but I'd need vacations if we did that. Yeah, I often thought if we did an episode every day, how I would uh, change my approach to it. But, right. uh, you know, maybe when we get older and <laughs> retired. And it's more, more retired. <laughs> yeah. And that could be possible. It could be possible. We'll have to see. Well, you're listening to... Adult Music, the podcast with music for the mature mind, classical and jazz, that is. And over there is Mike. This is my camp. And I'm Russ. And well, we had a golden week in Japan, except it didn't feel like it because, uh, well, they substituted days and I ended up only having one day off. <laughs> it was more, uh, yeah. more uh, hectic than usual. But we did uh, go out for a cycle, and that was nice. That was nice. We went off for some uh, German food, actually, down by Lake Biwa. Yeah. And I had a nice uh, five-day weekend, which is very nice, um, as the, uh, the less employed and more broke of the two of us. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> so it does give you free time, which is very nice. So. Yeah, and today, look, we had good weather for most of it. Today, I was just looking at the radar, and the whole country is covered in rain. <laughs> Yeah, today is a terrible day here. In, the uh, radar we are, is yeah. uh, showing uh, rain almost all over Japan, the main island, and uh, everything except Hokkaido. So it's a good night to uh, be tucked in and uh, either listening to or talking about music. And that's what we do here. And we've got six recordings as usual to yeah. uh, tell you about. Now, if you want to hear these recordings, if you haven't listened to them yet, I want to remind everyone that you can find links in the episode description for Spotify and Apple Music streaming for all the albums we'll talk about. Also, at the top of the description, there's a link you can get a full playlist on Deezer. It's our favorite CD quality streaming platform from France. I say favorite, but recently they've got a lot of uh, missing tracks and things. I don't, I don't know what's up with them. I've been having to write to them about missing tracks, and I'm starting to depend on them more and more for yeah. um, the classical releases. And they, they're and especially in classical music, they tend to be they don't really upload them all properly. I'm right. going to have to uh, be uh, an engine for change in classical music, <laughs> as far as I as far as I'm concerned. People don't really take this uh, form as seriously as it should be taken. Yeah. So. And Deezer has podcasts too, so it's uh, one place you can get the podcast and the playlist all together if you like. And uh, if you can't see the full description or recording list or the links aren't active for the recordings on wherever you listen to us, uh, some apps are better than others. You can always come over and check us out on our host site, Podbean, that's P-O-D-B-E-A-N.com. Everything's clear and easy to follow there. If you enjoy the podcast, please do follow or subscribe wherever you listen to us. Tell a friend. If you've got any music-loving friends, it's a good way for us to get new listeners. And if you take a moment to write a ranking or a short review wherever you listen to us, that helps us get recommended in the browsing category recommendations. And it's another way we can get new listeners. You can also come over and follow us on Facebook to get a little extra info during the week and new releases as they come up. You can leave a message or comment there as well. If you'd like to contact us directly with any questions or comments, we'd be happy to hear from you. Our email address is adultmusicpodcast, all one word, at gmail.com. A couple of podcasts we'd like to recommend to you, music-related, and we're sharing our audiences. Tom Gauker's Something Came From Baltimore. It's a jazz, blues, and R&B interview podcast featuring interviews with well-known musicians and interesting themes for every episode. Also, famous interviews in Neon Jazz. That's from Joe Domino, who interviews artists, musicians, and writers. I'll be mentioning him later because he interviewed one of the artists that I'm going to talk about tonight. And also, same difference, two jazz fans, one jazz standard, and that's Johnny Valenzuela and Tony Habra, who look at several versions of the same jazz standard each week, or maybe that's every other week, isn't it? The uh, standards one, yes, yeah, yeah. every two weeks. And new episodes coming out uh, tomorrow, tomorrow morning, think, right? yeah, yeah, for us, t tomorrow night. It's, it, it comes out at about the same time this right. podcast comes out. 
So they play snippets of each version of the standard and discuss the history of the original and the different versions. And they're they're very entertaining, I have to say. Yeah, like if you them, want to get you know. your uh, jazz standard knowledge going up, check that podcast out as well. Mm. Hold on, before you get into what you're going to get into, I have to issue an apology to Ms. Yuja Wang, whose name oh. I mispronounced all last week, because <laughs> it's spelled W-A-N-G. And of course, I was thinking, oh, 1980s new wave Wang Chung, right? So I was just thinking <laughs> Wang. You remember Wang Chung? D to live and dance whole days, LA or, a, or something. Dance whole days. Dance yeah. whole days. Yeah. So we used to pronounce it Wang Chung, but it turns out that in Chinese, the uh, names W A N G and W O N G are both the uh, King Kanji character, the O Sama in Japanese, right? Mm. So um, I think in uh, it's spelled W A N G in Mandarin and W O N G in the Cantonese, but it's all pronounced the same way. It's Wang, and I should have said. Yuja Wong. Oh. Okay, so my apologies to Ms. Wong for that. She's a great pianist, and I should say her name correctly. And I know people are going to go right to that episode and say, oh, that's how you say their name. Because I actually, sometimes I'll go to other podcasts and uh, YouTube channels to figure out how to say some of these names. <laughs> <laughs> I see I'm not really holding up my end here, but there you go. Yuja Wong. Well, great pianist. Yeah. We're sure to mispronounce something every week. As yeah, we, uh, like this week, for example. <laughs> we, here we got coming yeah. up. <laughs> this stuff. Uh, before we get into the music, though, we do have a couple of uh, departed music greats uh, that we should mention. And one of them is deserving of the theme. So, the theme. The Dies Irae theme. Here we Dies go. Dies theme. And this week's theme is for Don Sebesky, who was a, an American composer, arranger, conductor, and also a jazz trombonist. I didn't know much about that, but uh, he was also a keyboardist as well. And he trained in trombone at the Manhattan School of Music early in his career, worked with Kai Winding, Tommy Dorsey, and Maynard Ferguson, and Stan Kenton. And then in 1960 or so, he began primarily focusing on arranging and conducting. And uh, one of his best-known works of arranging was Wes Montgomery's Bumpin' album in 1965. Uh, he also did George Benson's The Shape of Things to Come, arrangements for Paul Desmond, Freddie Hubbard, and others. Maybe most jazz fans and even you know casual jazz fans will know this album, a Concerto by Jim Hall, that featured uh, Chet Baker, Paul Desmond, Ron Carter, Steve Gadd, and Roland mm. Hanna on piano. And that was arranged and conducted by Sebesky. And uh, just beautiful uh, sounding record. And the music really uh, sticks together nicely. He also did some kind of cheesier <laughs> jazz things <laughs> with that 70s kind of sound. But he was nominated for 31 Grammy Awards. And he did win three in the 90s. You know, three uh, so, out of 31? Boy, yeah. <laughs> I should have given but, him more. Uh, a long career, and he passed away. I didn't find out about it in time for last episode. I think it didn't maybe make the news uh, until a couple of days later. That was April 29th at right. the age of 85. So rest in peace, Don Sebesky. You know what's crazy about the Grammys is, you know, Beyonce is now the all-time <laughs> Grammy kind of winner holder. And she, the second one, the, the person she passed is George Schulte, the conductor. Wow. Now- Classical music conductors of that stature get loads of Grammy awards just because they mm -hmm. release an album every year and there's right. no competition. So they just hand them to them. Mm -hmm. So how many Grammys does Beyonce have? You know, right. you know, she just, she just made nearly as many albums as he did. Yeah. So she had to win in a lot of different categories. Right. Anyway, there's that. So I just wanted to mention that. Not to disrespect the departed, but. And one other departure, uh, not related to our jazz or classical uh, focused, but a big name that deserves a mention, and that's the Canadian singer and songwriter Gordon Lightfoot, who yeah, passed great away on May 1st yeah, mm -hmm. at the age of 84. And if you grew up in the 70s like we did, you just know all those great songs, yeah. The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald, and If You Could Read My Mind. I like to play that one on guitar and sing it. That would be nice. It's a pretty song. Yeah, really nice. Yeah, The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald, if you're teaching English, by the way, is a good song to do with uh, students because it's a story song. It's a story, know, so yeah. Kind of, yeah. I miss those kind of songs. Also, it was a seven-minute song on uh, that was a number one hit, I think, or it was very high up. Yeah. I don't know if it got to number one, but that was yeah. unusual even then. Yeah, I'd remember those tunes fondly. Mm -hmm. 
growing up listening to the radio all around the house and in the right. car. And uh, he had a really became... appealing voice. Yeah. Yes. Uh, rest in peace, Gordon Lightfoot. All right. So on to the music then. All right. We're all guitar this week. That's right. It's all guitars in jazz and classical. Yeah, and in classical, we're actually all solo acoustic guitar. I didn't. Mm. I should. I probably should have put in a bit of variety here, just because uh, the guitar. It's it's a very expressive instrument, as it turns out. We found out, yeah. but it's not quite as uh, like dynamic as say the piano or something like that. So if you're going to listen to like solo guitar, you you got a range of volume that's a lot narrower. But nevertheless, we heard a lot of um different tones. And one of the remarkable things about these three albums is that. Uh, that I chose for tonight's classical music is that all three of these guitarists have very distinct and very different sounding, I don't want to say timbres, the guitar timbre is the guitar timbre, but different sounds, let's say. Right. And they, they're they arranged here in from fullest to kind of narrowest, let's say. Yeah. Not, not that any of these things are bad, but it's just um, the way it turned out. I think the recording is very different on these just that albums. Too. and guitar is a hard instrument to record and you know normally you need several mics to get all of the complex right. overtones right. and things that come out and uh well i'll mention <laughs> you know what i think about uh, one of these i'll bring that yeah, up we were talking about this first one all week long the sound yeah. of it visage baroque and the guitarist is rafael fliatre which is pretty close to the uh, actual I probably have an accent, but that's his name, Fouillatre. Hmm. And this is on the Deutsche Grammophon label. And I think this is an overtone-rich recording. This guy gets like a pretty rich, full sound. And that could have something to do with the um, the arrangements, too. But anyway, let me just introduce this. Visage Baroque, which means Baroque Faces. He chose this title because it has to do with the different faces... And this is kind of a, an abstract meaning here. Faces that Baroque music can present. The booklet um, that comes with the CD mentions the sunny exuberance of a Vivaldi concerto, which we all know very well, or the poised clarity of a Bach prelude, or the intimate sophistication of the French harpsichord masters. Yeah, I would even say the kind of the gentle colors that the French harpsichord masters are able to conjure out of the instrument. There are also many more faces presented by Baroque opera. This is me now. And Fiatra uses two more faces, the altered appearance of a piece of music when transcribed from one instrument to another. I don't think any of these pieces are originally for guitar. They're mostly for harpsichord, and they're all transcribed. And uh, we talked about this on the podcast before. And also the guitars, he says, boundless range of sound. Well, I think there are bounds, but um, hmm. that's uh, Mr. Fiatra's claim. And maybe he'll demonstrate that to us in his career. Anyway, according to Monsieur Fayatre, uh, the guitar has so many unexpected colors and timbres that it's an endless source of inspiration. Well, good for him if uh, he if he can pull those out. So Raphael Fayatre, he's French. Uh, he was born in Djibouti, which is in Africa. It's on the northeast coast uh, near Somalia. Somalia is in the south and e Ethiopia is in the southwest. Let's see. He studied at the Paris Conservatoire, and before graduating, won the prestigious Guitar Foundation of American Competition in Louisville, Kentucky. We just heard their orchestra last week on the Yuja Wang recording. And immediately began a tour of North and South America before he graduated. So he was already on his way. Mm. Um, so he's an, a rising star. I think he's in his 20s now. On the evidence of this album, it's, uh, he's going to be someone to keep our ears out for. All the music on this album was originally written for the keyboard. The works were all transcribed by Foyatra's fellow guitarists, who include two of his teachers, and I think one or two of them are by him, too. All right, let's get into this. Um, the first track is the very famous Bach, Prelude in C Major, BWV 846 from the Well-Tempered Clavier Book 1. This is um, the piece that all piano students learn, and anyone who's ever played the piano has played this pretty much for his whole life. Here, his um, arrangement for guitar, I've heard many interpretations of this on the guitar is very pretty and it's really fast too it sounds like a gently rippling arpeggio on the guitar and um, i guess it's played at about the speed on the keyboard but all the strings resonate much longer than they do on the harpsichord uh, generally speaking if you're playing this on the piano um, you don't use the pedal but you'll hold the first two notes down and the other ones are just sort of played but in the guitar they all these notes resonate um, the guitar gives this quite a bit more harmonic bloom than the keyboard does. And I like the thunk 
that Foyatuk gets on the lower bass notes. And it sounds like he's using his nail when he does that. Somehow, I don't know if it's his instrument or what, but whenever we hear the lower end of his playing, the tone is really full. It's it's like we're hearing a lot of overtones, like more than usual um, in his playing, I thought. I had, I don't know, that's what I heard. Um, I heard a lot of like lower end, like resonating on this recording. All right, number two, Joseph Nicolas Pancras Royer, a piece called Les Mables, and it's a rondo. And um, it's number six from his Pièce de Clavecin, book one, arranged for guitar by the guitarist, Raphael Foyata. Uh, this melody is played over a rather complex and harmonically mobile accompaniment. It's catchy and tuneful in Foyata's hands. It sounds like it would be a bit tough for most pl- players to keep all of these moving lines coherent, but Foyata does just that. He himself made the arrangement, and it's an impressive feat here. At the change of section 2 minutes and 57 seconds, there's a fantastically vivid bass note to signal that the following is new music. It's got a lovely descending line. I like the slightly metallic sound Fiato gets on the chords after the 3 minute and 10 second mark. Then he goes back to the opening with a more cushioned attack to the tone. So he's got a nice contrast of tones, and this will happen throughout the album. He'll use the fleshy part of the finger to get that cushioned sound, and then sometimes you'll hear something more metallic as he hits the strings with his fingernails. The third through fifth track are Bach's on Concerto in D major, uh, BWV 972, which is Bach's arrangement of Vivaldi's Violin Concerto in D major. And this was arranged for guitar by Eudicael Perrois. The first movement, Allegro, so we have, that's, that's kind of complicated. <laughs> it was arranged from an orchestral work with violin to harpsichord and then from harpsichord to guitar. Yeah, It's like a double translation almost. Anyway, the first movement, Allegro, has a loud, vivid attack on the first chords. And at the 22-second mark, a chirpy Vivaldi theme comes in. This is one of those themes that friends would call sprightly, a word you never, ever hear unless somebody's trying to explain some kind of classical music to you. Um, The tone in the attack is more on the metallic side in the rapid passages of figuration and in the bass. There's good energy all the way through, and the sunny quality of Vivaldi's concertos comes through here. The second movement, Larghetto, has repeated rolled chords and has a more cushioned attack. Uh, The melody has a gentle early morning quality to it, like the sunlight is just appearing. Beautiful phrasing and very appealing. This doesn't change much as it goes, but Feyatre maintains interest easily. Um, The third movement, Allegro, this is track five, dancing heavily cushioned attack on the guitar. And I'm really delighted, by the way, Feyatre was able to present these three movements with completely different sounds, subtle as they may be. The dancing rhythm here is fresh sounding and genuinely cheerful. Listen to those extremely rapid accompanying figures after the one minute, 20 second mark, all performed without a change in tone in the melody. Excellent virtuosity serving a highly rhythmic movement. All right, we change a bit here. Uh, Track six, Jean-Philippe Rameau. We're into the French uh, composers now. L'Entretien de Muse. Number six from his Pièce de Clavecin, Avec une méthode, etc. <laughs> Sweet in D major, arranged for guitar by Michel Grisard. French music calls for a change of sound here, and we get a more chimey sound with a muted cushioned attack for this. Those two may sound like opposite qualities, but Feyatre achieves it. We sound like we're squarely in guitar territory with the figuration after the first minute. Sections change subtly in the work, and Feyatre gives us just enough of a sound change to indicate that we're moving into new material. I like the way the cushion bass note attack registers, particularly as we approach the end of the work. Track seven is another work by Rameau, Le Cyclops. This is a really famous um, work for the um, harpsichord, which you've probably heard if you listen to Baroque music at all. Mm. It's a rondo, and um, it's arranged by Michel Grisard. It has this repeated note rising line that you, you'll recognize immediately if you've heard it before. It's really catchy. And it's played here with that muted attack again, also with remarkable agility. It's instantly recognizable if you know the harpsichord version. Pacing is beautifully realized. It's playful and decorous. All right, tracks 8 through 14 are the centerpiece of the album. This is Bach's keyboard partita number one in D major. I think it's arranged in E flat major here, or some of them are in D major, some E flat major for the guitar. BWV 825. The original version was for harpsichord in B-flat major, totally different key, arranged for guitar by Gerhard Reichenbach. Foyatre says he particularly loves this work, and he had to record it. 
And um, it's really, this is a work I like a lot too. And hearing it on the guitar was very interesting. It's very different than the keyboard version. In the opening Preludium, track eight, we have a highly cushioned loud attack. The opening is played low in the guitar's melodic range. And then there's this rich sense of harmonics uh, captured on the recording, impressively bringing out the melody in the bass after the 21 second mark, or maybe later, like the 40 second mark. The tone brightens a bit in the work's last seconds for the tonic chord. Now, there's an interesting thing about this, because I feel like the um, the arrangement stays mostly in the mid-range of the guitar. Like, so you're, you're kind of having to dig out the sound a little bit. But I think that's mm. the arrangement there. The second movement, Allemande, has rapid figuration, a highly cushioned attack, with notes that are, again, rich in harmonics, but don't ring for long. The arrangement also has a lot of this in the lower range. I guess for ease of figuring on the on the guitar, this was arranged in the lower end of the guitar. For the B section, starting at the, the 1 minute and 50 second mark, the sound is blunter sounding still, taken at a higher speed with a sense of a hush over the phrases. It brightens up with a more metallic attack at around 2 minutes and 50, 55 seconds. The mobile bass line comes out strongly in the third minute with that metallic attack. Third movement, Corrente, uh, comes across as rapidly played. Foyat gives it a lilting, dancing melody of a type we generally don't hear from keyboard players. Uh, this interpretation has a deep downbeat. As a result, the entire movement comes across with a different and fresh quality to it. It sounds like the melodic material is on equal terms with the rhythm in this interpretation. I sort of wanted to hear this again after I heard it the first time. It was pretty um, ear-catching and different than we usually hear. Fourth movement, Sarabande. This is going to be track 11. Uh, here, Foyatre plays the opening chords as block chords. They're often rolled on the uh, harpsichord, giving a solid harmonic foundation for this particularly beautiful melody. The way Foyatre has this melody spool out is again fresh and different, as he doesn't pause for effect, but plays it straight through to the tonic chord. The opening repeats, and this time chords are more rolled and generally varied. The second time actually has a different character, accepting the harmony more. At around the 2 minute and 20 second mark, the B section starts. There's some impressive figuration just after the 3 minute mark. The repeat of the B material has a more reaching poetic sense to it than the intellectuality of the first time we heard it. There are lots of interpretive ideas here and lots of approaches used. Track 5, Menuet 1. This is unique too. The often motoric dance-like bass line is restrained here and the melody brought out more strongly as a result. The entire menuet is rather understated, and the sixth movement, menuet two, is played with a stronger attack, though cushioned, and it's really the trio to menuet one, which we hear again at the end, this time with a more metallic attack, like it's played with the fingernails. And the last uh, seventh movement, track 14, giga. The giga comes bursting out of the gate with rapid, very impressive accompanimental figures, the two-note phrases of the melody is passed from the high to the bass end. Foyat keeps this energy up through the movements two and a half minutes. Uh, he takes the downward moving chords just before the end as a spring winding down. I really kind of enjoyed this effect, losing energy of, or tension just before getting enough energy again to reach the last ringing, strongly plucked note. So kind of like a watch that's sort of unwound. He reaches the last chord. I really like the effect there. All right, we get back to um, French composers Antoine Fourqueray, La Belle Monte. This is arranged by Antoine Fourqueray, a different person, and Raphael Foyatre. I always love these um, instructions. It says, avec goût, with taste. <laughs> <laughs> so if you don't have any taste, don't bother to play this. Anyway, a dancing rhythm in this piece uh, with a cheerful melody. This is more of a bright attack, and the dancing rhythm is kept up throughout, as is the bright attack. Track 16 is Jacques Dufli, uh, La Fourqueray, which is, I guess, dedicated to the previous composer. I want to tell you a little bit about um, Dufli. He, he rather interestingly uh, died the day after the storming of the Bastille, huh. which wound up ending the courtly world to which he and his music belonged. So if you want to talk about mm. an ideal day to have your life end, if that's your career, that would have been it, I guess. He was at his most famous in the mid-1750s in Paris, and then after that, it fell into obscurity. This has a more cushioned attack from Foyat, as has been the contrasting way with this album. The bass registers strongly here, with the arrangement favoring the mid-range. Some pretty rippling figures are heard in the accompaniment, all of it fitting in beautifully. 
The attack becomes brighter by the first minute with the nails plucking the strings for a while instead of the fleshy part of the finger we heard at the beginning. Foyat keeps the rhythm lively, even in the less defined first departure from the rondo. The second departure has a dotted melodic rhythm, and the third a smooth arpeggiated pattern, passing from bass to high-end melody. Jacques Dufli again in track 17, Mede, or Medea as we know her. He was uh, Jason's girlfriend who he spurned. <laughs> and she was she was not very happy about it. And then this piece uh, indicates that. It has a rushing rhythm to it and staccato thematic elements. It has a bright fingernail plucked attack initially, some impressive arpeggios at the one minute mark. The rhythmic articulation is so strong that the playing actually generates some rhythmic excitement. There's a fantastic rising run that ends at around the two minute mark. And again, Foyatko's ear is very much on the rhythm, and this keeps the listener engaged throughout. Rhythm's kind of, I, we live in a rhythmic age, you know, with hmm. rock and roll and jazz. Um, they're very rhythm-driven types of music, so it's always nice to hear classical musicians pick up on the rhythm of these pieces, as Foyatko does here. And the final um, piece on the album is Bach's Gavotte and Rondo. This is from... It says it's from his lute suite in E major, but that in turn is a transcription of um, his um, violin partita number three in E major. So this is a famous work for the solo violin. This famous work is taken rather fast with a smoother rhythm and attack than we usually hear it with. That rather mutes the bright feeling this work usually generates, but again, it comes up as fresh and new here. I'm kind of marveling at the dark tinge that Foyatura gets to his sound here and really throughout the album. A lovely, tranquil ending to an intriguing album. All right, well, someone from Deutsche Grammophon wrote about Foyatre that not a speck of museum dust rises when Raphael Foyatre performs music from the distant past. It's a really nice way to hmm. describe uh, his playing, and it's a really nice thing to say, really. All this music comes up sounding fresh, with the rhythm playing strongly marked, and harmonics well caught. When I say harmonics, I mean the overtones. I shouldn't have said harmonics. That's a different thing, especially in the lower registers. This album is very rich in the lower end and the middle end of the of the uh, guitar's range. Fuyato uses a variety of attacks on the strings from piece to piece to keep things sounding fresh and interesting. Uh, the centerpiece of the album, the Bach Partita Number no. 1, was the standout for me, though all of this was really good. Fuyato had me hearing certain movements in a completely new way, and I enjoyed that aspect of the recording. Uh, he has a dark-tinged sound, which I think Russ is going to say is the recording, but I think it's his sound. We'll get into this in a minute. Um, achieved mostly by a strong attack in the bass and mid-range, and these pieces tend to hang out in that range. This is a guitar recital that stands out, I would say. I could do with less hype on this guitarist, but this is an album that's really worth hearing for classical guitar fans. I enjoyed the performances a lot here. I thought his technical playing ability is fabulous. And he also brings out a lot of keyboard or harpsichord-like flair in the way that he plays the notes. And, you know, it reminds yeah. you of how a harpsichordist would play them. But, of course, he has um, more sustain to work with. And it just adds a very interesting character to these pieces. And uh, I also really liked his control of dynamics and the Cyclops piece. He uses these very interesting shortened lower notes and there's a lot of contrast in his uh, fingering techniques and use of it. Yeah, but what I didn't inventive. care for, uh, in contrast to you, is the sonics on this recording. The guitar sounds very warm in with a good low end, but to me it's missing the complex higher overtones uh, almost completely on this recording. And when they record guitar, usually they'll have like one mic near the body you don't want it near the hole mm -hmm. because you're going to have two booming of a sound and then there's often another mic around the 12th fret and you know, they may other have other room mics but this recording to me i have no idea how they recorded it but it sounds more like a kind of a room mic sound and it sounds really warm and a very full low end of sound but i feel like i'm yeah, missing that missing mm -hmm. the high overtones that you usually get mixed in there. And uh, it was just surprising to me that it ends up mm. sounding very low-end rich. I thought there could be some more sparkle that must be uh, in his sound there. Yeah, I picked up on the low-end richness 
myself, but I just figured that was his sound. And there's really no way we can uh, know which it is until we hear more recordings of him or if we get to hear him live. So mm. we're going to have to wait till the next recording, I guess. But uh, there you go. It is very kind of, yeah, like overtone rich in the lower end, I'd say. Which is fine too, because uh, <laughs> there's a lot of guitar recordings that have the opposite problem that and the guitar right. comes out sounding really thin and that gets wearing right. uh, after a while so this does sound rich yeah it kept me engaged throughout though and i would i'd recommend it absolutely okay a recording that gets the guitar sound just right and this really is a mm. remarkably clean guitar sound is our next album paper moon sings by manos hajidakis uh, manos hajidakis was a greek composer who lived from 1925 to 1994 and his song paper moon uh, should not be confused with the jazz uh, standard it's only a paper moon so it's actually got a different title so please be careful the song paper moon is a very different song mm. people think the jazz song it's only a paper moon is called paper moon because of the movie yeah, that, oh, right, that right. ryan and tatum o'neill were in so that confuses people i think the guys on uh the uh same difference uh podcast actually did that it's only a paper moon made the same point oh, okay hmm. anyway on this album uh, paper moon songs by manos hajdakis the guitarist is elena papandreo who's a greek guitarist and this is on the beast label and it's also an sacd and that hmm. means you could hear it in surround which is a very odd thing to be <laughs> for a guitar yeah. a guitar <laughs> because it's like one instrument so basically the back speakers are just kind of like the whatever's bouncing off the back wall the kind of ghostly guitar sound from the back of the uh the hall it does give it a bit more like clarity i'd say but um the thing that um surround works best at is especially organ because it, the organ has a lot of different sounds it's coming from above and it just sounds like you're in church when you hear a surround sound mm. uh recording of an organ or orchestras of course because they're just so big and you can more of the sound field fits into the uh into your into the perspective that five channels give you Anyway, let's um, get into this a little bit. Manos Hajidakis was a Greek composer and is a legend in Greece. The notes in the booklet call him one of the most influential figures in Greek culture of the 20th century. He's best known internationally for his 1960 Oscar-winning song, Never on Sunday, which isn't on the album. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> you know, there aren't any other albums of his music except for maybe the soundtrack to that. I really thought that would have been a good idea to record that song here because um, it's we have new generations now. It's already yeah. like um, like more than fifty years old, right? Sixty years old, maybe. Anyway, so never on Sunday. You look it up on YouTube. He composed eleven instrumental works, thirty-six song cycles, sixteen ballets, as well as the music for sixty-one stage plays. Wow, wow. ten ancient Greek dramas, seventy-seven films, and more. Uh, these are all guitar arrangements of his songs here. And the original idea for this album was to have the French guitarist, composer, and arranger Roland Dien arrange mm. enough Hajidaka songs for an entire album, but he died in 2016 before completing them. So, as a result, his former student, the Greek guitarist, composer, and arranger Orestes Kalampalikis continued the project. And it's mostly Kalampalikis' um, arrangements that we're hearing here. We're only hearing two Dien's arrangements. In the booklet notes, we're told that the, several of the songs have magnificent lyrics, some written by Hajidakis himself. And of course, they're missing here. This is a guitar solo recital. In some of the songs that Orestes Kalampalikis arranged, he has tried to create versions inspired by the meaning of the lyrics. So I can't really compare these to the original songs. Yeah. I'm just going to have to go by what we hear. I really didn't know these songs. But um, I have to tell you, it sounds like they'd be uh, worth getting to know because... Hajidakis was a great melodist. Every one of these tracks is really um, catchy. Every yeah, every song so has a really yeah catchy melody. I was really into them, and I almost wish I could have heard the voice here. Let's go through them a little bit. I think we're going to have most to say about the arrangements, which are all very good, but I'll have something to say about that at the end. The first track is Paper Moon, and this is arranged... All these all of these are arranged by uh, Orestes Kylan Palikis, unless I mention it. There are only two that aren't. And he arranged this one. He gives it a romantic nocturnal flavor. And in the lyric, the poet Nikos Gatsos suggests that without love, everything is false, insignificant, made of paper. Like hmm. the paper moon. 
staccato arpeggiated opening. Papandreou's playing is very expressive with a lot of romantic rubato gestures. She gets a lot of colors out of the instrument, really on every track, uh, including the occasional harmonic and combinations of muted and aggressively plucked attacks in the same line. It's an immediately appealing melody, and the arrangement is inventive, keeping the accompaniment interesting and moving the melody into different registers each time it's heard. The song comes across as a set of variations on the melody. In fact, most of these will. The sound quality captures the timbral shadings of the instrument well. There's ample top end, but not too much room noise. It's a pretty close recording. I, I would say it's actually a perfect guitar recording. Mm. You could actually listen to this and see how the guitar should be recorded. Now, Papa Andreo has a beautiful sound as well, which of course helps. So we don't want to give the engineer all the credit. She has a really beautiful tone. Uh, the second track, The Urchins Down in the Meadow, uh, has a political text, which was written by the composer, which bitterly criticizes Greek society after seven years of dictatorship from 1967 to 1974. Uh, the Greeks are symbolized as amoral children who lack all sense of history and destroy everything they come across. Hmm, hmm. who else Harsh. can we apply this to today? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, staccato, ostinato, bass line, slow tempo, and again, an appealing melody. Even though it's kind of a... A bitter song, you mm. know? Notice again in the arrangement how the voice changes register unexpectedly, pleasing the ear and maintaining interest. I'm enjoying Papandreou's pacing and accentuations of phrase in this piece. The song has the feel of a Greek dance, uh, drawn out clearly in parts. Again, this is a set of variations on the melody. The quick arpeggiated accompaniment to the melody at 4 minutes and 30 seconds is especially memorable. And I also like the slow, almost frozen staccato chord approach at the end. Track three, Hymetus, named after one of the mountains surrounding the city of Athens. The composer wrote the lyrics, and they're ambiguous, but people from the era that it was written in suggest that it's about an illicit romantic relationship between two very famous and prominent people who were secretly meeting in a mountain chapel. Mm, <laughs> that wow. sounds like my kind of thing, really. <laughs> it's very Mediterranean to be having you tryst in a mountain chapel. There's a muted string effect at the beginning. This arrangement features a lot of effects. We hear the theme in the bass with harmonics up top, then hitting the body of the instrument to bring out harmonics. The sound has a very Greek sounding melody in the way it's accented. Inventive variations follow, including a subtle glissando just past the minute and 50 second mark. Inventive playing and arranging, and the song just ends in the middle of a phrase as though it were, as though the uh, lovers in the chapel are being interrupted. Um, <laughs> I rather like that effect. Track four, The Postman is Dead. Okay, this is one of the two Roland Dianz arrangements on the album. Um, the harmonizing of the melody at the beginning is special, especially on the quicker notes. It gives a gentle emotional pull that lightens the heart. Papandreou shows excellent pacing and technique. The melodies breathe beautifully, even when rapid repeated notes are being played in the accompaniment. This is a gorgeous melody and arrangement, and the melody just melts into the ear. I would sample this one if you're only going to sample. On to track five, Noble Dame. Uh, the dame in question was once the only friend of the king, in quotation marks. She is now faded, forgotten, and delusional. It's a sad lyric. It kind of reminds me of that movie uh, Sunset Boulevard with the, uh, the old silent screen actress who now is old and forgotten. Right, uh, very yeah. sad. Anyway, it's an appealing, really creative opening with arpeggiated melody twinkling in the higher end of the guitar's register. Uh, the melody really dances at its nostalgic mid-tempo in the second minute, and the expressive retard at the end is very touching. In the sixth minute, in this boat, this is about the feeling of loneliness and longing when thinking of the one we love. The mood of the sea keeps changing. It is sometimes still and sometimes restless. It has a quiet, tentative opening, with the opening notes repeating. We get a watery, drifting 6-8 rhythm. I like the metallic sound Papandreou gets in the melodic variation we hear at the beginning of the second minute. It's amazing how many contrasting sounds she's able to pull out of the instrument. Some of that, of course, is the inventive arrangement of Kalampalikis, but the two are kind of mixed mm. together so much I can't really tell which, which is which. They're probably both adding. Track 7, A Stroll to the Moon. Another song about thinking of the one we love. The lyrics say, take away my sorrow, let us take a stroll to the moon. I, I would, mm. I, that, would, that would win me over, I would say. As you might have figured, uh, the moon, 
and also the sea are often present in the works of Hajidakis. This song has an introductory section. The tune starts at the 35 second mark. It comes across as lighthearted and wistful. There are some lovely ornamented figures on the melody, particularly in the fourth minute. Here I'm also noticing that Papandreou has a lot of volume levels she can draw from the instrument. By her sensitive touch, she usually does these terraced dynamics or you know many mm. different volumes at the same time to bring the melody out and the have an, a quiet accompaniment. Very skilled guitarist. The Coachman. This is a love song written for a movie scene where a newly wedded couple take a coach ride through the streets of the Prince's Islands of Istanbul. It has an oriental flavor. And by that, I think he means like a, like maybe an Asian, like Turkish flavor here. The longest track on the album, this one is almost 10 minutes long. It starts sounding almost Spanish, which makes sense because the, uh, the Moors, you know, ruled Spain for a long time. And that sound that we think of as Spanish really comes from mm. the Islamic rulers of um, Spain in those years with its highly accented modal melody, and that's in keeping with the Turkish theme as Middle Eastern and East European modes got into Spain. The theme just before the two-minute mark has a highly spiced harmony and a traditional dance rhythm. Variations are inventive, and there's a stinging final note in the bass end that I really liked. Those little details just stick with me. Hmm. Track nine, I Have a Secret, describes the heartbeats of a teenage girl falling in love for the first time. After an intro, a rising ostinato line leads to the melody, which has some odd accents, hiding the key signature. I couldn't make out the number of beats. They change from measure to measure. And I guess that's the unsteady heartbeat of the teenage girl in love. Very, very clever. <laughs> There's some pretty harmonics at a minute and 55 seconds. Track 10, Little Ralu. Lyrics here by Nikos Gatsos. Uh, the song tells of a beauty that aroused passions with 40 brave men claiming her heart. But the moon, again the moon, moon, jealous of her beauty, sends a black rider to take her away. Uh, the idea that beauty kills has run through the history of Greek poetry since Homer and the beautiful Helen of Troy. And we get it again here. This is a longish track at seven minutes. It starts with a back and forth pattern, followed by harmonics. A beautiful sound all around. The slow hypnotic dance-like theme and rhythm starts at the 36 second mark with Papandreou adding some nice harmonic ornaments. I like the way she changes her articulation for various phrases, always keeping the ear interested. At the two minute and 20 second mark, we hear some banging on the wood of the instrument along with the transition section. By the wood, I mean the body. There's a nice crescendo to a climax and some intriguing twangs from the bass notes at the three minute mark. The following section is heavily articulated and rather powerful. At the 5 minute and 36 second mark, the quieter opening returns and is heavily contrasted from what we've just heard. Most of the theme is played on harmonics and the ends is a padding of the wood on the instrument again, and that's how the piece ends. Track 11, Wide Open Sea. This is the other Dien's um, arrangement on the album. This is a mysterious down-tempo tune it has interestingly colored harmony in the opening arpeggio. The following theme also has some interesting harmonic colors. Uh, this piece wanders a bit harmonically, as the title would suggest, and there are lots of lovely harmonics. In fact, there are a lot of harmonics on this album. At the 3 minute 19 second mark, there's an impressive repeated note accompaniment to the thematic material. This ends with a very pretty high-end harmonics and a final arpeggio. Track 12, Sweet Smell of Jasmine. Lyrics by Michaelis Bourboulis. The jasmine contrasts with the dark and stressful ambience underlying the beauty of the melody, and the lyrics provide a dramatic, dreamlike setting with hints of loss, grief, and death. Some pretty harmonics at the beginning, uh, with chords that remind me of recreations of ancient Greek lyre music. The modal harmony also has a Mediterranean feel to it, at the 54 second mark, a folk dance rhythm accompanies the melody. Chords are heavily accented at points. The rhythmic profile is strongly brought out. At 4 minutes and 18 seconds, there's a particularly pretty ticking pair of harmonic notes, which bring the tune to an end. And that's all of the hajidakas that we'll hear on this recording. We have one more piece, track 13, composed by the contemporary Cuban composer Leo Brower. This is called Preludio de la Nostalgia, and it's dedicated to Elena Papandreou, the guitarist on the album. It was written especially for this project and is inspired by Hajidakis' uh, Nenorisma, or uh, Lullaby, which we didn't hear on this album. 
It starts with a theme played on the harmonics, which seems to be a specialty of Pompandreou's, given that this piece was written specifically for her. Um, the opening is spacious and mysterious. We're not sure where it's headed, if anywhere, until around the 56 second mark when a song-like theme is heard. There's a real sadness to the melody here, as though at the thought of something permanently lost. I found the theme at 2 minutes and 48 seconds to be particularly lovely, both in Brower's conception and Papandreou's execution. I'm also struck by the sheer amount of space in this piece. Many tones are left to decay into the background silence, especially between sections. The spacious ending is also left to decay into complete silence. All right, so that's the album, and this is a really impressive set of arrangements and performances of these songs that I hope will give Haji Dax's music more international recognition. It certainly deserves it. The album is beautifully recorded. Papa Andreo is an inventive guitarist coming up with a wide range of sounds to express the various facets of each of these songs. And they have a lot of appealing facets. All of the melodies are memorable. Hajidakis is a composer who should be better known outside of Greece. I'd like to hear some of his instrumental works to see if his strong sense of appealing melody transfers to those larger multi-movement works. I strongly urge listeners to hear this album, but I do have one sort of thing that I want to mention. Uh, Papa Andreo uses all of her techniques seemingly in every song, and this is understandable because uh, the songs were arranged with her special abilities in mind, and so she can present them in concert. Like she could pull one of these out, for example, as a, an encore, and she'd be able to show off all of this um, wonderful technique and sounds that she has. But in a program like this, you'd kind of want the tracks to vary a bit more, like the sounds that you hear to not be in every mm -hmm. track. I kind of wish one or two of the arrangements were a bit more straightforward, just like the straight guitar sound that we usually hear, not relying on varying sounds that the guitar can make. But um, again, that's a that's a small issue. The, the album itself is really appealing, and I would urge you to hear it. Yeah, what strikes you right away is just the great melodies here. Every song has uh, an instantly likable melody that pulls you right in, and those are arranged in very interesting ways as well. So I thought it was an attractive presentation. And I was also really attracted to the phrasing. And I think maybe that's one way the performance captures some of the missing vocal quality. They're right. phrased very much in a natural way that you can imagine. This is a sung piece. And so that I found endearing too. I liked the sonics on this recording as well, uh, captured the full spectrum of the sound, and it was just really enjoyable music. I think it's nice to hear classical guitar playing this kind of material as well. And I think anyone would like this recording. Uh, you don't have to be a classical music fan or a uh, you know, guitar aficionado, but if you are a guitar player, I think you'll really enjoy all the techniques and a yeah. wonderful sound here as well. So I really liked it. Yeah, and it's a great uh, recording as well, as we said. The sound quality is excellent. Yeah. Lots of space. Okay, so our, for our final uh, classical guitar recording is um, a composer that I've been listening to for quite a while. The Italian composer, Carlo Domeniconi. And this is his um, sweet, it's, it's a fairy tale for solo guitar, Sinbad, Opus 49. Well, that's pretty intriguing, I said, and I had to hear that. <laughs> this is played by Selila Refik Kaya on the guitar. He also plays the Oud, but not on this recording, and he's Turkish, and this is on the Naxos label. Now, Domeniconi, he's Italian, born in Cesena in Italy in 1947, but uh, don't let that fool you. His music is uh, more Turkish than anything else. Uh, he has, <laughs> In his younger years, he made many trips to, I guess we're going to say Turkey now, right? Um, I guess, and became fascinated by its culture, and his music plays heavily on Turkish and Middle Eastern modes. Yeah, and after yeah. listening to this, do they ever? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm going to hear a lot of that. 80 minutes of it, in fact, which was quite a lot. He founded the classical guitar course at the Istanbul University State Conservatoire, and the critic Michael Leiden accurately commented that Domeniconi's music seeks repeatedly the synthesis of East and West. Yeah, that would be his whole project. <laughs> you can hear that right away. The Sinbad Suite was first published in 1994. The title of the work, Sinbad, and all the movements are given in German on the album notes with English translations, but I'll read the English only, being that we're an English podcast. Uh, this work has three cycles to it, 
but it really should be listened to from beginning to end. Now, I split I split this up into three <laughs> separate listenings because this does get a little bit uh, when you hear those um those uh, Middle Eastern modes and those Turkish modes, they really do get a bit uh, perfumey, let's say. Yeah. It's sort of like, I should say this at the end, really, but it's sort of like if you walk into a lavender field and you smell all that wonderful lavender and it just overloads your nose and pretty soon you're not smelling it anymore. You know what I mean? It just, right. The smell just disappears because it's just, it's it overloaded your nose. And I think that kind of happens with this music as well. I shouldn't say that right away, though, because it really is something worth hearing. And let me explain why a little bit. Cycle one, number one, each of these um, cycles has seven, I guess we can call them movements in it, or seven sections. I'll call them movements, though. Number one, Baghdad. The movement has an authentic Arab oud ornaments and musical gestures, as well as traditional musical modes in order to evoke the city of Baghdad back in the day, and maybe even today, too. If you know the stories, uh, Sinbad the Porter, and the story comes to the house of Sinbad the Sailor, and is invited in after the sailor hears the porter's prayer and realizes that he has the same name. And he tells him uh, of his adventures trading on the high seas. Uh, the movement ends with an oriental Arabian Persian scale providing contrasting images of the two Sinbads. And we're going to hear that more in the cycle as well. It's important to remember that because musical episodes throughout will portray the very different characters of the two Sinbads. This first movement is fairly long at about eight minutes. And the very last movement at the end of cycle three will also be long with the rest being a little shorter in between it begins atmospherically and modally which always gives a whiff of incense or mystery i really love the scales being engaged in at the beginning there are those quick spanish arab eighth note endings to phrases you know, like the da -da -da, you know that you hear in spanish music a lot and due to the mode used no sense of a harmonic resting place Extra guitar effects include knocking on the wooden body of the instrument at 2 minutes and 14 seconds and a single harmonic at around 6 minutes and 10 seconds. Yes, notice the very different way Domeniconi uses harmonics than we heard in the previous album that were really arrangements of Hajidakis' music. Domeniconi will tend to use the um, harmonic note, a single harmonic note is like punctuation. It's like a period at the end of like a, f a phrase or a section. And you hear them a lot. They're almost like a signal to you that something has ended and something new is going to start. The recording is also atmospheric with plenty of room ambience, though the recording is close enough to allow you to clearly hear the attack. The guitar tones rise into the room like exotic incense. This is a highly atmospheric movement, evocative of place, and played mostly at a relaxed tempo. It's not boring, but it makes the mind drift off into dreamy places. Uh, the movement ends on an intoxicating single harmonic note. Number two, cycle one, Sinbad. Uh, here, Sinbad's ship founders, and he finds himself on an unknown island, as he does basically in all seven of his voyages. <laughs> I, I wouldn't want to get on a ship with Sinbad. <laughs> they don't seem to do very well. Anyway, although he does wind up very rich at the end of all the adventures. This is briefer, and uh, these um, movements are going to get more episodic, and they're illustrative too they're they're drawing a picture often of what's happening um, this has a more this mode is more directional the line rising and quickly falling back the opening perhaps outlining the foundering of the ship which is not too exciting in this musical interpretation i'm not really sure how we know that guitar can be a very dramatic instrument as we know from flamenco but i don't know how well it can illustrate like a a foundering ship which <laughs> really requires an entire orchestra i think and before the first minute with a single harmonic note, an effect I'm realizing I enjoy at the end of phrases, followed by more exploratory, cautious uh, theme, as though someone were carefully and attentively searching. This is interrupted twice by highly perfumed guitar figures playing Arab or Middle Eastern modes. Number three, Sinbad's Journey. This is vigorous throughout with the full sail into the unknown. Starts similarly to the ending of the previous movement and the, the guitar figure presumably indicates Sinbad at sea. There's a lot of pointillist detail in this movement, and here especially, we're hearing Salil Refik Kaya's virtuosity, both in speed and ability to highlight specific voices in this highly detailed and layered line. There's some nicely placed harmonics in the movement, always a delightful surprise since they're so seldom used, and uh, used only for accents. There's a ticking single harmonic notes in ending the movement, 
I want to mention the sound of uh, Kaya's guitar is the exact opposite of Foyato's in the first movement. It's more kind of thin and doesn't resonate as much. It, the, the notes decay very quickly. And I suspect that's because he's using a capo on the guitar and that's kind of cutting off the full resonance of the instrument in order to get these, because that's what it sounds like. I, the decay is much faster when you put a capo on the neck of the guitar. And that's part of how he's getting these um, exotic um, modes to ring out the way he does. Track four, the battle with the waves. The waves increase in intensity with intervals of contemplation, and the storm leaves Sinbad shipwrecked on a distant shore. Uh, the opening starts. I'm just, I'm just thinking, if you ever meet Sinbad in real life, d don't travel with him. <laughs> You're just going to wind up shipwrecked <laughs> and probably dead. He always lives, though. The opening starts almost contemplatively, perhaps indicating a calm sea, but tension does gradually build, as does volume. The figuration gets busier and very impressive. I salute Kaya for his virtuosity and layers of volume in putting this movement across. Then more hesitant as Sinbad is shipwrecked on the shore. I think the Menaconi is going for a mood here, uh, that more of a mood than for any kind of tone painting. There are no big climaxes, and the movement again ends in glistening harmonic notes. Number five, the egg of the ruck bird. Now that's spelled R-O-C traditionally, but I have a, a volume of this um, of these Sinbad stories, and he spells ruck R-U-K-H. So I'm guessing that's closer to the Arabic mm. pronunciation. Now the ruck bird is so huge that they capture baby elephants in their claws to feed to their young. And this movement is tension. It's full of tension and suspense, evoking Sinbad's anxiety and curiosity. Now, these notes, by the way, in the booklet come from uh, Domenicone's notes on the score himself. Another writer has copied them. Uh, there's a welcome change of tone and texture here as we hear metallically played chords struck with the nails and a precise, sturdy rhythm count with lots of silence as the curious Sinbad explores and perhaps even touches the egg. Listen to the gently rubbed chords at a minute and 36 seconds and after the 2 minute and 10 second mark. After 234, there are several hitting of wood and scraping of fingers against strings effects. Number six, diamond fissures in the Valley of Snakes. The brilliance of the diamonds is contrasted with the grotesque and horrific figures of the giant snakes. <laughs> this is a really weird episode in the stories. The snakes guard the diamonds, so in order to get the diamonds, the uh, the diamond hunters have to they have to kill a sheep and throw it into the <laughs> into the diamonds <laughs> and the diamonds stick to their blood and then they pull the sheet back. It's really nuts. Anyway, the movement also features a change of approach with a more angular rather than curvy thematic and rhythmic contour. Extra guitaristic effects abound. Listen to the prolonged scraping of strings after the 42nd mark. The rhythmic continuity stops and starts a lot in this section. At 2 minutes and 30 seconds, there are a lot of harmonics. Domeniconi always seems to isolate these as single notes. The ending is very faint and quiet, with gently plunked notes and scraping of strings and downward note bends or glissandos. Number seven, the final uh, movement of cycle one, Homeward Bound. This is a cheerful movement. It starts with a repeating note followed by a modal melody. The theme, as it builds, becomes more appealing and the accompaniment more virtuosic. At two minutes and 30 seconds, there are some interesting harmonic-related effects that I'm not entirely sure of how they're produced. They sound great, though. Uh, the movement and the cycle ends on a modal chord with only a faint sense of rest, as though the mind still has its thoughts on adventures to come. And indeed, there are still two more cycles to go. Uh, <laughs> this, would, this would have been great if it had, the entire piece had ended right here, because it's really good, <laughs> and I'm still interested, but it goes on for a long time. All right, so here we go to cycle two, number one, the storm. Okay, and I'll mention, these are all cycle two now. I'm just going to mention the numbers. Menacingly played modal figures are heard at the beginning. There's a harmonic at the 45 second mark. He uses them for emphasis, as I mentioned, and very sparingly throughout the work, maybe once or twice in a movement. This is supposed to be a storm, and I imagine the picture from the swirling building figures, but the guitar really isn't the instrument for this type of image, because when you have Beethoven Symphony Number no. 6 with the whole orchestra <laughs> producing a storm like that, it's not going to come across the same way. This is more of an abstract impression of a storm here. It is great playing, though, and Kaya keeps up the momentum. There's some cool hammer-on effects in the bass after the three-minute mark, and some impressive figure playing an exotic harmony from three minutes up to the end of the movement. Number two, 
The saving driftwood, after being shipwrecked yet again, Sinbad clings to a plank from the ship, and this has fantastic upward modal arpeggios beginning the piece, exotic sounding. This is a gentle, spacious movement full of intoxicating modal arpeggios. Number three, Sinbad's Despair, starts rather in the same mood as the previous movement ended, but some more exploratory melodic figures are added. It's slow and weepy in tone. Notice again a phrase ending harmonic at about the 42nd mark. This movement sounds illustrative of the emotions it's portraying, giving musical figures that give you a picture of someone suffering rather than conveying that suffering directly to your emotions. It's almost like you're observing this person suffering from afar. I love the modal harmony, though, and there's an inconclusive ending on a harmonic note. Number four, The Little Men and the Giant. This is a contrast between the naive and harmless little men who are shy and curious. They're represented by a sequenced figure with a rhythm to the sequencing. There are grotesque and dangerous giants, which are louder and uglier in harmony. You'll notice it. The harmony includes the, indicating the grotesquerie of the giants. Number five, The Escape. The opening figures are short and have pauses between figures. In the first minute, there's some impressive, quick, virtuosic playing on rising patterns. The repeated notes are fantastically quick and even. Uh, number six, The Wedding with the Princess. This is a really interesting story, too. This portrays exotic and colorful characters from the South Sea Islands. All is well until the princess becomes ill and dies. So Sinbad lands on this island, and the um, he's given this, the, this beautiful princess's hand in marriage, and he's like happy to have her. But then she dies, and then he learns that the custom of the land is for the, the spouse to be buried alive with the person who just <laughs> died. And um, they should, probably should have told him that before he married her, but uh, he didn't know. Anyway, he, he, he gets buried alive in this cavern, but um, animals have been coming in to eat the dead bodies, and he kind of follows them out and escapes eventually. Anyway, a similar repeated note pattern to the previous movement is heard. And harmony we've been hearing throughout a lot of this second cycle is heard. It rocks back and forth harmonically. A serene theme comes at about the 52nd mark briefly. And the piece continues in the same vein, ends on high harmonics. And then we get to number seven, Buried Alive, which I just explained what happened. A rather disturbing set of harmonies are arpeggiated and strummed at the beginning. There are a lot of changes of character in this movement. I think we hear Sinbad escaping at, and after the three-minute mark, there's a smoother arpeggiated figure as Sinbad recalls his adventures. Rapid repeated notes and a spiced-up chord and the movement and the suite. But there's still another suite. Cycle three. Number one, A Journey to India, a movement I enjoyed a lot. Here, Domeniconi switches to characteristics of traditional Indian music, still through Sinbad's eyes. It starts in the style of a raga with the alap, which is the unaccompanied introduction to the rag. Uh, the work moves on to become rhythmic and virtuosic. To me, though, the beginning actually sounds like the sound of a tambura, like right before the alap starts, although the tambura is setting the uh, background droning during a performance by a voice or solo instrument in tabla. Uh, Damon and Kony actually creates the sound of the solo instrument over this as well. The guitar is doing all of this and keeps a semblance of multiple instruments going as the piece gets quicker and more complicated. This is a standout movement, and I'd recommend you um, sample this if you're interested. This is uh, track 15, cycle 3, number 1, A Journey to India. We hear the tambura imitation again at the end, the final note being one of Domeniconi's much-loved harmonic notes. Number 2, The Subterranean River. Atmospheric, quick, repeating, arpeggiated chord opening with repeated notes on top and the usual intoxicating harmony. I'm not really hearing joy in this, but okay, I'll take it. It sounds more like a sound illustration of the river to me. It says that the uh, movement starts in joy and ends in anxiety, so that's why I mentioned that. The figuration reminds me of the three-handed effect Liszt got at the piano, with several repeating effects in motion at the same time. Impressive virtuosity here from Kaya. This ends on a sudden resolving set of notes. This is another one worth sampling, actually. Track 16. Number three, At the Tomb of the Ghost King. This is a solemn, religious, and contemplative movement. It's slower and more spacious than what we've heard before. The guitar sound here is light. I'm not sure the guitar does solemn well, but this does sound spacious and contemplative. It ends with intoxicating harmonic notes and a final harmonic chord. Number four, the flight. Arpeggiated chords drive the rhythm. 
and arpeggios underpin the thematic material throughout, apart for some brief pauses. It's a fairly fast-moving section of the cycle. In the last minute, harmonic chords interrupt the flow momentarily. The high-speed arpeggios continue, and a single bass note indicates Sinbad's fall, followed by a perfumed chord that doesn't resolve the material. Oh, by the way, in this movement, uh, Sinbad is, uh, he, fall he falls from the sky and finds himself once again lost on Earth. Sinbad's mm. Transfiguration, number five. This brings a union of Sinbad the Sailor and Sinbad the Porter in a process that exceeds human understanding. So there's a kind of transcendence happening here. Now we hear motifs from the previous movement and from the Sinbad movement here. It harmonically wanders quite a bit. It's hard to tell where we are in the intro, and I'm sure that's the point. It's a bit contemplative, and it ends inconclusively. Number six, serendipity. One of my favorite words, by the way. It depicts a time of happiness and contentment. It's energetic, and it has rapid repeated notes characterizing the beginning. They lightly play it in the high end, and it's a very brief piece. And the final movement, number seven, cycle three, Return to Baghdad, brings together a number of themes as homesickness impels Sinbad to prepare for the journey and embark on his final voyage. Motifs are heard from Sinbad, Baghdad, and representing Sinbad the Porter. The final sections bring Sinbad back to his homeland. His homeland. The beginning has some compelling harmonies. They sound Asian, possibly Indian, but far away from Baghdad, where we're returning. The movement bookends the entire set of three cycles, and as it's long as the very first movement we've heard, and repeats a lot of themes from the opening cycle. There's an active happiness for this movement, especially evident after the minute and 30 second mark. This feeling continues throughout the seven and a half minute movement. Arpeggios spill out of the recording until they slow at the end for the final chord. So I just want to say each movement in this three cycle uh, work uh, is intoxicating on its own, but together it all might be a bit too much. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot because we're hearing the same instrument for 80 minutes playing kind of um, modal harmony. I personally had to break it up. I listened to it each cycle individually. I feel like the Sinbad stories are so much larger than life that they need a bigger canvas than the solo guitar can provide. That said, this was an interesting listen. I like uh, Domenicone's invention with the modes he uses. He has a way of invoking foreign people and lands in the way his modes, harmonies, and melodic lines all sort of act together and intertwine. There's a sense of business and foreignness all at the same time, or busyness, let's say. Each movement in this long work is a full episode and really a full piece unto itself. They can easily be isolated from the suite and played alone, perhaps as an encore. And uh, the guitarist Cecile Refikaya's playing is highly virtuosic throughout. He manages to make his guitar sound light-toned, approaching the sound of a lute. I wonder if that's his technique or the type of guitar he's playing. And due to the fast decay, as I mentioned, it sounds like he's using a capo for the um, harmony on most tracks. The playing is often rather high up on the instrument, and the light, fast, decaying resonance on the instrument is in stark contrast to the rich and full sound that Raphael Foyata gets in, on the first recording we heard, particularly in his bass end. One of the fascinating things about these three recordings is how different the tones and overall sounds that the three guitars produce are. It's been an interesting week this way. Three guitars, three very different sounds. I thought this was really engaging modal music. Really impressive playing with some unusual techniques. Yeah. Uh, wondering what he's doing, uh, even if you're a guitar player. Uh, like you say, it is very long. So you may <laughs> want to break these cycles up separately because when you listen to them, the episodic nature, I think it makes it interesting to think about how the music relates to Sinbad's adventures. So you mm -hmm. want to kind of you know, know the story or maybe look up the story and follow along. And that makes it kind of like a little program to enjoy. But uh, at 80 minutes, yeah. uh, you, you'll probably want to do it in uh, different sections. But it's certainly something very different. And also having all those modes for such an extended <laughs> period of time, you may yeah. uh, find yourself transported into yeah, a different culture. It does make the mind drift, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, but yeah. it's very different and uh, unique recording. It's kind of like smoking a hookah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they told us. All, All those day. Birds, eh? All day long. <laughs> mm. And again, the overall effect, I just want to say, of the album is like, like I said, if you're in a lavender field and you smell that pungent smell of lavender, that wonderful smell hits you and you're so happy. And then after a while, you're just not smelling anymore because your just <laughs> nose is saturated. You know, that kind of happens here. It's almost like you're not hearing. 
mm. you know, you're, you're kind of like, you know, harmonic sense kind of shuts off after a while because you're just hearing a lot of these kind of similar modes. Anyway, right. check that out. Well, three very different recordings there in classical. And are you guitared out yet? I hope not. Kind of. <laughs> but <laughs> so, but th these have other instruments in them, though, so we're not going to yeah. hear only guitar here. We're going to keep the guitar focus in the jazz segment uh, tonight. And I have to confess, uh, we're, I'm going to be a little bit uh, looser and uh, more overview-oriented because I just didn't have time to do my usual uh, deep, geeky music listening this week uh, Actually, i'm gonna listen to this and want to do that the same with classical music and now the listeners are all saying <laughs> maybe you should mike i don't know <laughs> well you know usually say we, the average recording is an hour long it can take me two to three hours to get through a recording you know satisfying myself that i understand what's going on and mm -hmm. although i was listening to these throughout the week while i was doing other things i needed to do i didn't actually take notes until today so wow. you're going to get a little more condensed version but the important thing is that you listen to these because they're all very unique also in their own way and we're going to start out we're going to go from our uh, sinbad's journeys to get some brazilian <laughs> blood flowing through our veins i, I don't believe sinbad went there <laughs> no <laughs> and uh, we got two fabulous brazilian guitars to now are both active in the u.s and that's Chico Pinero and Romero Lumbambo, two brothers. That's the name. It's on Sunnyside, and it came out April 14th. Well, they're not actually brothers because they're kind of from, uh, well, a little bit of a generation gap there. Pinero was born in 1974 and Lumbambo in 1955. Wow. Pinero's really making a name for himself. He's been nominated twice for Grammy Awards in 2019 and 2020. We heard him a few weeks back with Jeremy Pelt's The Art of Intimacy, Volume 2. But I've actually known Lubambo's playing for quite a while. Uh, he was a guy who everybody wanted to have on their records uh, going back to the 90s. And I think I first heard him with Tom Harrell on his wonderful recording, The Art of Rhythm. That was 1998. It explored a lot of different Latin rhythms. And uh, whenever I would hear him after that, he's really instantly identifiable, unique kind of sound and technique, which I'm going to have a problem with on this record because these guys actually sound like two brothers. Mm -hmm. And there's almost no information online about who's playing what. So I can't tell. <laughs> yeah, all you need to know really is who's in which channel. And they yeah, that's, I that's couldn't what, figure what that you out. Need so. to know. Yeah. But uh, I couldn't find that information, unfortunately. Uh, but they are of one mind, like two brothers here. And they're also really close friends. And the story of this album seems to be pretty engaging as well. Lobombo moved to the United States in 1985, and he had long associations with Astrid Guerrero, Herbie Mann, uh, also Luis Bonfa, and others. And then about 12 years ago, I guess, back in Sao Paulo, he was introduced to Chico Pinero, and they became friends right away. And Pinero studied classical guitar as a child, and he started playing professionally at age 12. Imagine that. And he's made a lot of collaborations, Placido Domingo, Brad Meldau, Ron Carter. And when they met, they became friends and wanted to collaborate. And Pinero's moved to New York now uh, five years ago. And so now they could uh, collaborate more. And they used to play together at uh, Lumbambo's house. And they had talked about recording for a while, but it didn't happen. And that's where the producer, Matt Pearson, uh, made a link between these two. And he said, let's do this and get an album together. And he also helped uh, fill out the program, which is really interesting and varied here. I was surprised by you mm. know, the this sources is really interesting, yeah. of the music here. And so you're going to get this recording that really shows all the wonderful things these guys can do. Always sounding Brazilian, but uh, covering a lot of jazz territory and really cool arrangements of this material too. So this was recorded in New York at Sear Sound Studios in August of 2021, but it's just come out now. And we're going to start out with some Brazilian music. And they're both playing a mix of acoustic and electric guitars. But these are very mellow, hollow-bodied electric guitars. You're going to have to really listen closely to mm -hmm. even realize this is an electric guitar on a track. And sometimes there's different combinations or all acoustic. Now, here we go. Let's butcher some pronunciation. Oh, yeah. I can't <laughs> help you here. Portuguese, yeah. Uh, I'm going to guess. Aquela 
Um. And this is a track by Javang and Alder Blanc. It's a very sunny, rhythmic Brazilian sound to get this uh, recording going. Starts off with rhythmic on the beat strumming on one guitar and then another added strum to that that's syncopated for a very mm. interesting effect. Yeah. Then perfectly synced unison and harmonized melody figures make this tune really unique before they split off and each other uh, solos while the other turns to rhythm. And then they come back to those sort of synced uh, melodies together. It's a really interesting arrangement, starts things off in a good mood. And we'll keep the Brazilian mood going with Samba e Amor. This is a Chico Boraki tune and a really moody, relaxed tempo tune here. They started out with synced rhythm figures, trade off on melody sections that have kind of jazzy double stops in them and dizzying fluid solos on this track from both of them. And the ending has a really tasty rhythmic tag section to it. Another nice arrangement. We'll get a tune from Michel Legrand, Windmills of Your Mind. Uh, this is a tune recorded by a lot of artists. It's a really longing minor ballad, and they've got a lovely arrangement here with a dreamy kind of synced rhythmic intro, ringing harmonics that add a pretty touch to it. And they stick pretty close to the melody, trading phrases, joining in unison in different sections. And there's an outro, like the intro to Mirror Image with final ringing harmonics. A really nice treatment. Four, can't get any more Brazilian than Hobim and his tune Red Blouse. There's a bell-like ringing rhythmic intro that segues to a bouncy Brazilian rhythm with great bass lines too, because we only have two guitars on this album and they're covering you know all the spectrum of the chords and the melodies and the bass really stands out here. Great rhythmic interplay as they change up the feels throughout the song. Super fluid electric solo, I believe on this one, and then an acoustic solo and great final ringing chords together. Then, Bill Evans's Waltz for Debbie, and this is a short strummed intro that they give it here, and then the famous melody gets traded off between both guitarists. It sounds like both acoustic guitars here. The variety of the rhythmic accompaniment is great. They keep changing up from arpeggiated ideas and other kinds of strums. There's double stopped melody lines, and it really gets chugging uh, more than mm. you usually hear it done in a relaxed waltz fashion. But there's some really speedy acoustic guitar solos on here, too. Back to the Brazilian source with another whole beam tune, a famous one, Wave. And yeah. it's a very cool eight measure rhythmic intro of descending figures that they start out with, and it slows down, sort of puts on the brakes into that famous melody that's yeah. got a great relaxed boss of feel. Traded melody sections again, solos with little bluesy ideas that that final minor chord section that's famous in this song, uh, they pull out a little bluesy kind of feel there. And they give it a matching outro for the beginning, ending in the first melody phrase of the melody. Nice arrangement. Now, another famous tune. Let's switch over to Stevie Wonder. Wow. Uh, mm. Send One Your Love. And this is a very cool arrangement with cool muted accompaniment at the beginning. Nice technique. And then it sounds like this tune should have always just had a Brazilian rhythm. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's great fluid solos here, too. A really nice treatment. Then I was surprised. Uh, the next tune, Billie Eilish. Yeah. <laughs> That's one. Uh, my right future. up to date here. Yeah, My future, and yeah. This is actually a very lovely, delicate acoustic playing of this tune. It actually does have kind of nice chords, and I really like the tempo they give that just flows easily. Um, not being a Billie Eilish fan myself, I did go and listen to her take on it. And then uh, I like the kind of flowing nature that they added you know, to this uh, interpretation of it. I got to say, when you hear her music like acoustically like this, it mm. suddenly becomes like much more appealing because she uses yeah. a lot of like those electronic effects and that's right. really not for me. But yeah, yeah he, just the song structure is, is very good. It's very solid. So yeah. I liked hearing it this way. This was compelling. And yeah. next we're going to go to Lennon and McCartney for No One, a tune from Revolver. Yeah. And they start this one out with thick synced chord strums. It's a very interesting arrangement of the tune with a nice bounce added to it. And the rhythm variations, uh, sometimes with a triplet feel, is very cool. Great fluid solos here and a pretty ending as well. 
And we're going to get another Chico Baroque tune, Moro Dois Irmanos. Mm, sounds good Probably to me. pronounce that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a lovely ballad, uh, lush chords, gently strummed, pearly acoustic solo lines that just sound so rounded and nice, and also a more rhythmic solo uh, in contrast there too. Track 11, Henry Mancini and Johnny Mercer, Sally's Tomato from Breakfast at Tiffany's. Mm. And this is kind of interesting to hear done just with guitars. I have heard uh, sort of Brazilian versions of it before, but you know, you're normally used to thinking of Henry Mancini's kind of uh, mm. big treatment of it. Anyway, sync strumming to start it, and it speeds up into an energetic Brazilian rhythmic treatment with some super speedy jazzy solos in here. And they have some fun kind of doing uh, chord jamming with strumming for an ending of the tune. And we're going to end up with Stings until... Well, this was nominated for Academy Award and Golden Globe winning film... Uh, Kate and Leopold and mm. uh, this tune if you know it has got you know it's a string arrangement really and so they started out here with a cool muted intro and I thought maybe that was inspired by the pizzicato strings in the original tune that's a nice little contrast then it gets an unhurried bossa type feel with melody line trading tasty double stops there's a pause and a modulation about midway through and some great rhythmically snappy solos over the relaxed chord backing. It's really interesting how they can, using this Brazilian feel, can make the chords sound quite lazy, but the solos are really dazzling and mm -hmm. uh, snappy. And so you get that. And great interplay all the way to the end of the tune. And that's it for what I can see on the CD release and also what's available on streaming. But there are two more tracks Okay. that say I was reading somewhere available on uh, digital platforms, but I haven't seen them anywhere. There's another Michelle Legrand tune, You Must Believe in Spring, another kind of jazz standard almost, and then Beauty and the Beast. So <laughs> if you look around, you may find them uh, available somewhere, or maybe they'll be available later, but uh, I couldn't um, locate them anywhere to listen to. Uh, anyway, beautiful sounding guitars, great synergy and interplay, and a very interesting selection of material. It all gets that magical Brazilian touch with creative arrangements and dazzling solos. This is a really enjoyable album, easy to listen to. You sort of don't even notice how great the technique is, and these guitars just sound fabulous. It's going to put you in a good mood. Yeah, it's um, if you've ever heard Bossa Nova, you pretty much already know more or less what this is going to sound like. And you also know you're going to get this very high skill of guitar playing. But what was most exciting here is that the, the way the two guitars interlock yeah. uh, so much, it was really dazzling to hear. And they're doing it, you can kind of hear what each um, guitarist is playing because they're each in a different speaker channel, like one's on the left, one's on the right. Yeah, you know, they're they're just really great the way they interact together. They're sensitive, you know, they, the timing is fantastic. And the record just feels so good. Mm. Um, I liked all the covers too. It's because when you hear a familiar tune and you hear it in this style, it always kind of makes me perk up yeah. a bit. So I really enjoyed that element of it too. You know, it's a really inventive album. It's pretty mellow, sets a good mood. Absolutely recommended. Yeah. Yes. They do play like their brothers. They have that kind of, yeah. you know, synergy. It's, 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 and, I was, uh, I was wondering, I mean, now I'm going to have to pick this up now. <laughs> <laughs> we just talked about it. Like, I like it more now. <laughs> The next recording is a guitarist I was unfamiliar with, and I always want to try to find new artists to learn about. And this is Kenny Reichert on Shifting Paradigm Records, and it's called Deep Breath. Also came out April 21st. Reichert's born in Brookfield, Wisconsin. He began studying classical piano at age five, switched to guitar at age 12, and he attended Berklee College of Music. Then he went back to Milwaukee, to complete his studies in economics, the hmm. University of Wisconsin. And now he's getting a master's of music and jazz studies at DePaul University. It says, this is his quote, this music was inspired by a collection of reflections between September 2021 and June 2022. Periodically, I find it important to check in with myself and ruminate on my life. Every song on this album comes from these meditations representing various moments over the past several years. Unquote. So it's mm. a kind of introspective look at these songs, and there are a lot of interesting ideas that come out, and I'll 
talk about those as we go on. And as we recommended in our other podcast uh, sort of collaboration, uh, Joe Domino's Neon Jazz, he's got an interview with uh, Reichert from April 18th. So if you want to hear yes. direct from the source, check that out. It's also available on YouTube. So we've got Kenny Reichert on electric guitar, Tony Barba on tenor sax, soprano sax, and bass clarinet, John Christensen on acoustic bass, Devin Dropka on drums and cymbals, and Alyssa Allgood on vocals. And also she wrote the lyrics for the tunes that she's on. And all compositions here are by Reichert. We're going to start out with a track called Mirage. It's a really nice melody on this tune, handled together by Reichert's guitar and Barbara's tenor sax for 16 measures that are repeated. Then there's an eight-bar bridge section where the sax sort of takes the contrasting line, and then we hear the 16-measure line again. That's the structure. Reichert also gets little fills and chords underneath the melody at the same time, which is really cool. And Christensen's bass lines have really nice intervals. The drums are so light that it has a very airy and slightly Latin feel to it. But the drums are going to be really light on most of this recording. Yeah. It's kind of a feature. A record solo's first, and he's a very fluid player. He's got a unique tone that has a little kind of country sound to it, I think, compared to other jazz guitar sounds, and a very pleasing reverb that he makes good use of. He's also got really different articulations and tones, so he's got a real palette that goes on display in his solos. He gets a combination of like pearly, rounded notes and also little twangy picks all in one solo. I, I noticed that right away. And Barbara has a breezy tenor solo after that. He's got a nice husky tone, some edge on higher notes, and then they take it out with a repeat of the melody sections. A very nice melody that pulls you in right away. Track two, Communion with Nature. This one <laughs> was a, not hmm. what I was expecting. It was interesting, though. It starts with some drumming uh, that includes some, sounds like electronic pads and yeah. and electronic bass tones uh, from percussion. It sounds right out of the 1980s. Yeah, it has a stop and start feel to it that keeps you on edge, wondering, <laughs> is this going to continue or or what? And it does that for about a minute and a half. And then guitar and bass join in for a 24-measure melody section. It has a tentative feel keeping with that intro with uh, repeated phrases, but then it turns brighter and more assured as the melody goes on. Then there's a pause uh, with more percussion, and then the melody repeats, but this time with Barbara's sax added to the guitar. And uh, Barbara has a sax solo, nice relaxed phrasing, even when he gets speedy. There's some angsty cries uh, for a climax to that, and then it has a soft ending. And Reichert's solo is next, relaxed and pensive, but with some snappy rhythmic ideas and nice blooming tones uh, in his solo lines. Kind of a cool, softly throbbing bass underneath from Christensen uh, that makes the real pulse of the tune. And they finish up with the melody with sax included, and then some soft sax over ringing guitar rhythmic figures for a soft ending. Track three is Spears, and this is a blues, really, a 12-bar blues structure. It's got fun, boppish melody lines that are taken together by the sax and guitar, and it has a kind of monkishness to it uh, in its cool harmonic tensions and little unexpected gaps in the lines. Uh, they go around that twice, and the Christensen is up for a bass solo first. Very interesting, hesitated-type phrasing over very light drumming, and then... When Reichert solos next, it gets chugging along uh, when Christensen gets back to the walking bass. Uh, nice guitar solo, speedy double time lines, bluesy licks, tasty double stops too. There's some cool harmonic surprises <laughs> in his choices of notes uh, that uh, are kind of fun. And Barbara gets a sax solo too, and he has a nice exploration of the harmonies. A couple more times around the quirky bluesy melody to finish it out. Track four is called Bashful, and this has an intro with sax and guitar working lines together, and then Alyssa Allgood, uh, who wrote the lyrics for the tune, joins in on vocals. And it's a nice ballad with a catchy melody and nice chord changes, with a real sort of jazz standard type quality to it. Uh, Barbara adds soft sax fills, and he gets a silky solo himself. The drums are so quiet on this track, sometimes you think there's no drumming on the track at all. Uh, Riker does a tasty solo here, a relaxed 
but seasoned with some speedy licks and pearly tones. And all good returns with more vocals. I like her enunciation. She has a sort of subtle vibrato used sometime in good phrasing as well. Track five is one of these introspective tunes. I gathered a deep breath and Reichert starts it out solo on guitar with kind of rising and falling rhythmic figures of melody and bass lines. He's doing both. And so you get this sort of full spectrum just from the guitar. Uh, new figures are joined by cymbals and soft ringing bass. And then Allgood is featured again here with more of a spoken type vocal that asks questions like, where do you go when you've been there before? Hmm. And the answer is, you become introspective, letting deep breaths be your guide. Uh, so it's very atmospheric with a breathing quality to the phrasing of the tune rather than having any constant rhythmic push. Barba adds some soprano sax here with phrasing that matches the swelling quality of those phrases over Reichert's guitar. It gets a little more intense and then recedes to a soft ending. Track six is called How's It Going? A lightly swinging 6-8 to here in a 32 measure AABA form. Barbara's back on the tenor for the legato melody that Riker doubles in spots on the guitar. A little more drum, subdividing the beat on this tune with brushes that cuts through. Riker solos first, good rhythmic snap in his lines, and I really like his connection of melodic ideas that build and go through phrases that keep on connecting and building up. Barbara has an energetic tenor solo, fluid lines as well, lots of double time phrases, and all of that's over Christensen's bass bounce that really drives things along. There's some cool bass double stops in there as well, if you listen to what he's doing. One more run through the melody to close it up with a nice little extra tag on the ending phrase. Track 7, I've been thinking a lot about you. Well, ringing bass intervals and cymbals make a kind of mysterious atmosphere at the start. Guitar and high bass clarinet lines kind of snake in with a melody line. It's light and floating over the heartbeat-like bass below. And then the sax and guitar lines match up with the bass pulse with descending note phrases. So they start moving together. And Barbara gets some soft, low, improvised flutters on the bass clarinet over ringing guitar before the snaking melody lines with guitar return, and then it just ends on those descending figures that are synced up with the bass. A kind of unique sounding tune. Track 8 is called Skip, and it's got fun rhythmic rising and falling figures in the guitar and bass that make an 8 measure intro, and then we're off on a very speedy unison melody with guitar and sax. I guess you can start counting double time from there. It's in an AABA construction with the B section, interestingly, just being a modulated version of the A for a contrast. Uh, record solos first, interesting rhythmic feel and figures, as well as speedy runs. And Barbara's speedy and a bit squawky with an exciting tenor solo, getting a little bit of a Pharaoh sanders -y kind of uh, mm. effect there. Really driving bass from Christensen underneath. And they use the intro section idea again to get Drobka going on a speedy but light drum solo. And once more around the speedy melody with fills from Drobka to finish it out. I just want to say for that track on um, the um, the sax, it really, it really gets to some wailing like Pharaoh Sanders type sounds, but it's kind of recessed in the mix. So you don't really get the full impact. Mm. Or maybe I just had the headphones too low. I don't know, but it didn't really impact me as much as I thought it could have or mm. as much as it does on like say a Pharaoh Sanders album. What did you think about it? It's not uh, too cranked up in the, yeah. in the mix. It's a little bit subtle, yeah. Right, which I thought was odd for that kind of sound, but maybe mm. they just didn't want it to blow us away. <laughs> It'd be too loud, yeah. Track nine is Nanjing, what place I've been. Oh. A rubato and floating bass clarinet over ringing guitar and bass decorated with light cymbals make an intro. Then guitar and clarinet move together with phrases over synced bass and drum fills with the melody line. It's kind of like a walking procession feel to it. Hmm. Uh, it floats free for a while with guitar and clarinet flutters, then come to a pause. And then there's a repeat of the walking melody line to finish it up. Uh, it's very short and sweet at just about two and a half minutes. Track 10 is Balance. It's a soft flowing minor waltz melody that turns brighter in spots. It's played together by Reichert and Barba 
on bass clarinet here, and it's got an A-A-B-B-A form, kind of interesting. Uh, Reichert has a gentle solo showing off his tone, and Christensen gets a short, ringing, deep-toned bass solo, once more through the melody to end it, but on an unexpected, brighter final chord, sort of wants to end in that happy place. And track 11 is a short one, uh, Reprise, and it's less than two minutes. It's a solo guitar, ringing, reverby, and echoey, and it's very atmospheric, and Reichert uses the echoes sort of to time his phrasing in interesting ways. So it's all about uh, that unique tone and his various techniques on the guitar. And that ends the recording. I found it refreshing with a lot of space in the arrangements that stands out from the kind of uniquely soft drums of Drobka. Uh, Reichert's originals cover a lot of different ground from the altered blues tune, a jazz standard like vocal tune, and other atmospheric songs. It keeps you surprised and engaged. His guitar solos are creative, impress you with his technique, and he has that palette of different tones and articulations that I found appealing. Barbara's sax playing is enthusiastic, and we get extra tonal variety with soprano on a tune, some nice bass clarinet as well. And Christensen really impressed me with that solid driving bass work and cool lines under everything. My ear was constantly drawn to him. So I found it a unique and really satisfying recording. Yeah, most of this album has kind of a quiet after-hours vibe, and I really kind of dug that. The playing is mostly understated, except for we mentioned the sax, the wailing sax right. solo in the middle. But even that doesn't jump out simply because of the way it's uh, in the mix. Yeah, I thought, you know, understated playing is kind of a nice thing. And it's very, it's, it's sort of like the opposite of what Americans normally do. We're always trying to stand out. But here everybody's just kind of, you know, playing fairly quietly and really well. The music, it does, you know, it's very present, but it doesn't absolutely demand your attention. It's just very politely there if you want to listen, and I like that about it. It's got some pleasant things to say that might chase the blues away. So I'd say I'd give this a recommendation. I liked it a lot. Yeah, it's got a very personal type of uh, feel to it. I, I like that he shared this kind of introspective side of music, and uh, you get to hear that, and it makes you think. I was, I was also interested that the uh, the tracks are kind of top-heavy, where at the beginning, you get most of the solo workouts, like you hear everybody, and the tracks are longer, and mm -hmm. then they get gradually shorter with less soloing yeah, as they go on, I guess, which yeah. I thought was interesting. Hmm. Yeah, and at the end, we just have that one almost yeah, two-minute long track yeah. that's just sort of atmospheric. A nice uh, laid-back listen for the most part, yeah. after hours. <laughs> All right, and then final album really caught my attention because it's uh, featuring the music of a great trumpeter. But the leader is guitarist Jason Kaiser, and this is Shaw's Groove, and that would be Woody Shaw, hmm. and it's on Origin Records. It's his debut on Origin, and it came, also came out April 21st. So Kaiser's a guitarist, composer, the band leader of the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay, a new acoustic music band. And the interesting thing is his background is he's got a bachelor's degree in bluegrass, old time and country music studies. <laughs> and where would be a better place to get that than East Tennessee State University Indeed, uh, in 2018. And then he's also got a master's in music in jazz studies from San Jose State University in jazz guitar from 2020. And he's here interestingly, playing the music of Woody Shaw, uh, both some of his original pieces and, and songs that he often featured, with another guitarist uh, sharing, double billing here, really, John Stowell. So we've got two guitars again, and <laughs> since I don't know either of these guitars well, I don't know who's playing uh, what, because there's no uh, notes about that. Anyway, they have a previous recording from last year together. This is a great title, The Axe Axis. <laughs> That's good. And, uh, it's also under Kaiser's name, and the two of them together on all acoustic guitar recording. Uh, so check that out if you enjoy their guitar playing. Also, what makes this recording very unique is the rest of the lineup. We've got Eric Jacobson, and now this is a, there's another trumpeter who we featured a, a couple episodes back. Uh, this is a different Eric Jacobson. Uh, spelled differently, E-R-I-K-J-E-K-A-B-S-O-M, trumpet and flugelhorn here, Aaron Linkton on Barry Sax, and Dan Robbins 
double bass and Jason Lewis on drums. So Barry, trumpet, and two guitars makes for an interesting tonal balance on melodies and things. So I was uh, really interested in this recording because, you know, Woody Shaw is, well, many people think he was the less great innovator of jazz trumpet coming after somewhat contemporary of Freddie Hubbard, and they made several recordings together. But he really took trumpet playing to a new level harmonically. Uh, he wrote a lot of really cool modal original compositions, used intervals in his lines that are really hard to play and no one had used before. However, you know, his timing of uh, you know his peak creativity came mostly like in the 70s when jazz was in kind of a rough spot. And so his music was not fully appreciated and he kind of had a tragic ending to his life. Although we have seen in more recent years, uh, Brian Lynch, you know, then we had the Latin side of Woody Shaw's music. It was a great recording, but we don't often see uh, his compositions uh, performed, especially by uh, trumpet players even. And so here it's really interesting to see a guitar's perspective uh, on this. So I have all of these CDs really, and I'm really happy because when I was looking, I noticed that a lot of them are not available on streaming. I it's guess they're sad. just too old mm. or slipped through the cracks. Yeah. And some of them are kind of out of print. They're hard to get your hands on. But uh, I was really happy to have my collection to refer to uh, just to compare some of these. So we're going to start out with Organ Grinder. And it's a Woody Shaw composition. I believe this goes from Woody 3, 1978. And Jacobson on trumpet and one guitar on the melody uh, with the other guitar for rhythm. It's always interesting having two guitars there. And then Barry Sachs joins in on the next melody section and making a really thick line. And then there's kind of a third part where the Barry continues on with just guitar and the trumpet drops out. That's the sort of structure of this tune. And Jacobson solos first with some nice repeated figures uh, modulated around two guitar solos here, rhythmic backing for the first one from the other guitar, but not on the second one. And Linkton gets a Barry Sachs solo as well. And I really noticed uh, Lewis's cymbals stand out driving this tune along. It gives it the feel of the original. And there's another run through the melody to finish it up. Track two is called Zoltan. And I believe this is from Love Dance, a 1975 album. Uh, also a Woody Shaw composition. Uh, the guitar started out over Lewis's dancing cymbals again, and the horns emerge with soft lines into the cool modal melody lines working together with guitar. There's some cool dissonances when the horns back uh, guitar figures that come out before they join up again together. Interesting rhythmic ideas in the first guitar solo here with some cool muted ideas in there. Jacobson has a trumpet solo next. It's a creative one with some cool interval lines and some high register reaches. And Lincoln gets a Barry Sax solo with rhythmic licks and some low digs down in the lower register. There's some cool guitar swelling underneath the Barry Sax. And then the second guitar solo over some great bass work from Robbins with snappy figures into chugging walking. The horns and guitars trade eights into a final melody run. Now, a really famous uh, composition from Show The Moon Train. This is from an album of the same name, 1974, and this featured the great trombonist Steve Ture, who played a lot with Shaw in his younger years. And this sounds really thick uh, with guitar, trumpet, and Barry together on the melody. Uh, the original tune had organ, uh, but here they keep a similar kind of pulsing groove with it, using the two guitars. The solos are guitar, then an intense Barry Sax solo, a contrasting lyrical trumpet solo from Jacobson. And check out how the second guitar solo picks up on his cool rhythmic lick and you know, uses that to get started with a lot of dazzling licks. The horns and guitars trade some fours with Lewis's speedy drums before another round of the melody and some final tasty guitar licks at the end. Track four is Katarina Ballerina also from Moon Train. And there's also another version I have. I was trying to track down where it came from. I have this kind of compilation. I think it's Michael Kuskuna produced recordings. It's called Dark Journey, but I couldn't find what original release that different version uh, was from. Anyway, here they give this a more 
dainty treatment than the original from Moon Train. Just trumpet and two guitars to start it out before bass and drums join in. Flowing guitar and trumpet solos, the drums drop out for the start of the berry sax solo, which kind of gives it this nice leanness, and then they join back in again before they're out once more at the start of the final melody. I like the unique light feel they gave this one. Track five is Blues for Woody, and this is uh, written by Woody Shaw and Ronnie Matthews. This is from the recording United 1981. Uh, the original started out with a piano solo uh, from Mulgrew Miller. Uh, here, the horns and guitars come right in on the melody, and it's a faster tempo. A really caffeinated guitar solo to start things out, hmm. and then a berry sax solo over just guitar until the bass and drums return with a nice roll in on the drums. It's another guitar solo with some interesting phrases and spacing that makes it kind of unique and then a really intense bass solo from robbins with killer note attacks it just <laughs> sounds like uh, so much presence on uh, his articulation jacobson has a fine trumpet solo here again with cool interval ideas kind of shaw inspired uh, they keep it up with a final melody and then some tasty guitar doodles at the end track six obsequious obsequious this is by larry <laughs> young originally album titled uh, In the Beginning was recorded in 1965, but the music for that recording was not released until 1983. It was kind of a shelved recording. And then it was called uh, Cassandra Night, but uh, it goes all the way back to 1965. This gets a very different treatment from the original, which bursts right out at high speed with very intense modal melody lines from Woody Shaw and Joe Henderson is the sax player on the album. It's a really powerful kind of full blasting modal tune. But here, it starts out with just guitars in a kind of rubato fashion. Bass and drums join in, still rubato with legato flowing horn lines. Then there's some really echoey reverb guitar and it stays kind of amorphous but then it picks up a slow beat into the melody lines on a horn and guitar to finish and then i could recognize it but i no, i would have had no idea what the tune was until i got to that uh, final melody so it's a departure from uh, the original probably the biggest different kind of arrangement of one of his tunes track seven is uh jean marie and this is another tune by ronnie matthews this comes from 1976's little red's fantasy the original started out with a piano solo, but here they come in right away with the melody. This one keeps pretty close to the original, both in tempo and feel. Again, trumpet, sax, and guitar work the melody together. This one has little answering phrases for the sax to split off from the trumpet on the melody. Uh, a really well-developed trumpet solo here from Jacobson, uh, skillfully weaving ideas through the modes. And again, the guitar picks up the cool interval <laughs> ideas uh, from the trumpet uh, to get his solo started. Lots of blazing cool rhythmic licks in the guitar here. Robbins gets a bass solo again, impressing with great attacks and rhythm. And they take it through the melody again, and then some bass and guitar vamping gives Lewis some time for intense drumming before the horns join back in to help end it. And the final track, 8, Shaw's Groove. This is Kaiser's original, sort of inspired by Woody Shaw's type of compositions. And in the spirit of Woody Shaw, it's a cool modal tune. Now the intro has legato horn lines and guitar together that makes the swinging 5-4 feel very clear. You hear three beat and two note pattern in there but then when the tricky melody and the horns and guitar starts you'll lose track of the meter right away mm. because it's got really odd starting phrases that uh, camouflages that in a unique way the two guitars get a lengthy section of nice interplay and solo line exchanges and we get to the solos robbins has a real secure chug back so you can feel the meter clearly again the horns float in with interweaving lines they get busier with improvisations and Robbins gets another bass solo as well. Very cool with double stops in there. Interesting rhythmic ideas. And they go around the melody once more. And then there's an outro like the intro to add some final guitar solo ideas over as well. So this was really interesting to me. I was excited to see a recording of Shaw's music and by a guitarist, no less. His music never got the attention it deserved in his lifetime, so it's nice to see people still paying attention to it. The arrangements here are inventive, sometimes sticking very close to the original, but there are a few surprises. And then this unique instrumentation 
two guitars, trumpet, and Barry sax. Great solos all around. Very exciting guitar work on this recording by both guitarists. And very nice trumpet work from Jacobson. I was impressed with his solo ideas. And that intense bass work from Robbins really gives a little extra energy to the recording. Yeah, you mentioned that the uh, the arrangements were you know really inventive, and I kind of that kind of made me come away thinking that the real stars of this recording were the compositions themselves, and mm. the musicians almost almost the way classical musicians do it, serving the composition. You know what I mean? Right. Rather, and they do step out a lot, but they you know they're kind of it just came across for me with the, that the music was front and center in this, and I really appreciated that, and especially being mostly a classical music listener. Themes were played, I think, pretty faithfully, as far as I know. I mean, I don't know the compositions as well as you do. And um, f solos are, you know, good, straightforward, mostly, but they step out a bit. I got the impression that the uh, musicians were really enthusiastic to, to be playing this music, too. And um, I thought it was just a solid and very good album and, and very enjoyable and uh, something new for me because I don't really know these compositions very well. So I was really interested about that. I thought it was kind of laid back, too. It kind of had more of a laid back feel for the most of it. Hmm. And only eight compositions. I could have done more, I thought. <laughs> yeah, there's certainly more in Woody Shaw's catalog to look at. But, I, yeah. yeah, I was really pleased with the treatment they gave these because uh, yeah. these brought me back to my teenage years when I, you know, was exploring Woody Shaw's playing and I listened to these recordings a lot. And I was really impressed with uh, Kaiser, you know, thinking he's got also this whole country kind of music yeah. background and right. to go from all the way from that to Woody Shaw's really interesting, complex modal jazz. It's a really uh, wide range of uh, abilities and talent there. And I want to check out some more of his recordings. And I yeah. just listened to a couple of tracks from that Ax Axis and yeah. <laughs> go back and give that a more leisurely listen to hear his uh, acoustic playing on there. So now he's on Origin Records. So, you know, we'll keep an eye out and see what he comes up with next. Yeah, I think this might be like a unique release for him. He just, and it's good for us too, because um, like you said, the music of Woody Shaw, his, his albums are out of print and you can't hear them on streaming. So this is really a good way to discover it. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, hopefully, there's a there's a lot of stuff you know that um, is hard to find on streaming, and also it's hard to find on CD too. Mm -hmm. And so I often fill the gap with visits to the used stores because in Japan uh, yes. you can find a lot of stuff that's not available anywhere else. Right, and uh, you really want to hold on to those uh, recordings because you don't know. You know, there's some things I imagine there's just not much demand to get them you know, on streaming. I mean, there's a surprising amount of stuff that is available on streaming that's not available anywhere else, but the opposite is true too. There's some things you just can't find at all anymore. Right. And, um, but you can find them here. <laughs> you can still find them. That's right. Yeah. Japanese people are big collectors. So yeah, there's a good chance that somewhere, somewhere it exists. Yeah. There's that one, I think I shared with you the, uh, Gary Bartz and Sonny Fortune. Yeah, oh, I love did. that album. Yeah. And, uh, you know, good luck finding it. I think you can find it used if you want to spend a lot of money. Uh, at least that happens in Japan, too. When someone knows they have something that's yeah. become somewhat rare, they put it online <laughs> for sale for some ridiculous amount. It's like $800 or yeah, something. Yeah, they see that happen a lot. <laughs> anyway, that's just one of the ones that I was lucky enough to find somewhere. And it turned out to be a real gem. Yeah. Anyway, there you go. All guitar in jazz, too. And uh, next week, we're going to do an all one instrument focus as well with uh, piano. And not only are we going to do the piano, but I am going to make a rare foray into very familiar composers next week. Oh. You know, people's favorites, Chopin, Schumann, Brahms, wow. Tchaikovsky, you know. I'm usually going for the unknowns more, but... Balances out the all contemporary recordings we heard last From week. the American composers, yeah. Right. And mine's going to be all European as well. A lot of uh, piano stuff to choose from. It just happened to pick all European players, and there's going to be some variety there. Uh, starting out with some good old-time hard-swinging piano, uh, and then some mm. more newer takes. So if you want to find out what those recordings are... Uh, shortly after this episode is published. I'll also put up the playlist for Deezer, and there'll be a link to that on our Facebook page. So be sure to check that out if you want to get started early listening. And I am definitely <laughs> going to try to get started early so I don't fall behind uh, this next week. Okay, so yeah, the Tchaikovsky recording I mentioned like Deezer didn't 
load the entire <laughs> album right. in, so I'm going to have to get you that one somehow. We'll, we'll see. All right. Well, thanks, as always, to Fast Signs of Staten Island for our glowing neon logo catches the eye. And when we finish up here, we'll have little promos from those uh, podcasts that we recommended. So stick around, uh, listen to what they have to say, and do check them out if they sound interesting and you need some more music-related podcasts throughout the week. And that's all That's all I've got for this week. All right. <laughs> I'm already ready for the piano. All right. So we'll be back next time. Episode 115, all piano recordings. And I'm looking forward to checking those out. Until then, keep listening, and we'll see you again next week. Gerald Albright, Rhea Schneider, Charlie Hunter, Luke Robillard, Sean Jones, Walter Beasley, Steve Swallow. Something Came From Baltimore is a jazz, blues, and R&B podcast and radio show, and it's not really about Baltimore. Subscribe to the podcast and listen to your favorite artist or future favorite artist that something came from Baltimore and be a part of that Be More music scene. Joe Lovano, Jeff Coffin, Paula Cole, Denuso Makatani, Ann Passio, Chess Smith, Thumbscrew, mostly. Hi, jazz fans. This is the founder and host of Neon Jazz, Joe Domino. It's both a weekly radio show and interviews with musicians from all over the world, like the Netherlands, New York City, and back to Kansas City, the home of Neon Jazz, covering the rich history and modern world of jazz in a fresh way, featuring interviews with the likes of Arturo Sandoval, Sonny Rollins, Maria Schneider, and countless others. Find our weekly show on Mixcloud. Subscribe to the interviews via iTunes and YouTube. We are Neon Jazz. Same difference. Two jazz fans, one jazz standard. A review of a single jazz standard through music, history, and stories. And this is AJ. And this is Johnny. If you are a jazz fan and you like jazz standards, bebop, show tunes, ballads, you name it. Yeah, we've got them here. We drop a new show on you every other week, and we take a standard, and we listen to a few different versions of it. Same difference. Come join the fun. Looking forward to seeing you.